Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Creative Fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. You're in the Dr. Finance Live podcast episode here. Dave Kirpin is our main speaker today. And uh, so honored to, to meet our New York Times bestseller, amazing marketer, amazing entrepreneur. Uh, love to get to know him. So let's give Dave a warm welcome. Welcome, Dave. How are you, sir? I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Welcome. So, Dave, uh, welcome to our show. Um, and we actually started bonding a little bit on Clubhouse as well. Uh, but behind the scenes, you are an amazing entrepreneur. Um, also, uh, I'd like to learn about some of your, your not only your marketing efforts, but you were an editor, I believe, of Inc. or a columnist at Inc. Magazine. Is that correct? Yeah, I write for Inc. Yeah. Write for Inc. Okay. So, first, let's start with um, maybe your origin story. If you want to tell us a little about yourself. Uh, where you came from and and your you know your journey to get where you are today. Sure. So, um, well, I came from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, grew up uh, oldest of three, and um, I had um, quite a bit of uh, turmoil as a child. My dad had uh, bipolar disorder, uh, became independent really early on, um, and helped take care of my younger brothers. Um, I got a scholarship to Boston University. Went to school up in Boston and um, took a job working there at the ballpark because I was a huge fan of uh, baseball and I wanted to make some extra, make some, make, make some extra money. And um, so I worked at Fenway Park in the Boston Garden, uh, one of the vendors that sells food up and down the aisles. And uh, what most people don't know about that business is that it's, it's, it's a business. You're sort of a mini entrepreneur, you get paid based on how much you sell. And um, uh, so it's commission and tips only, and it's also a seniority-based system. So you got to work for years to sell the, the, uh, the, the, the beer or the hot dogs. So I, I, I was assigned a product called Crunch and Munch, uh, buttery toffee popcorn with peanuts, sold six boxes my first night, came back, developed a shtick in order to sell more product, and um, eventually sort of developed, you know, became the Crunch and Munch guy in Boston, sold quite a bit of product, and, and was making... Uh, uh, the first night I ever I worked, I made $15, the legal minimum. By the time I left, I was making over $1,000 a night. Um, and I fell in love with marketing, sales, PR, um, entrepreneurship. Um, the rest is history. I, I uh, became, actually, I was a financial advisor. I worked for Guardian uh, oh, wow. after, after I graduated. Um, I was a top producer, but I was very uncomfortable selling... Uh, selling a uh, whole life and products that I wasn't, uh, I, I kind of realized that um, I was being told to sell products that maybe weren't the best for my uh, customers. So despite the fact that I was making really good money for a 21 year old, I, I left, um, I went to Radio Disney where I was the top salesperson in the country. This woman started working in my office. She dropped me to number two, realized uh, can't beat him, join him. So I, I, I married her and went into business with her. <laughs> um, but um at the time, she was actually a married, so uh, I couldn't get married her and go into business with her right away. Uh, she she moved to New York, and I did what anyone with unrequited love would do. I went on a reality TV show to find true love. Wow! Uh, it was a sleazy, a, a sexy singles at a luxury resort, and me, which made for great uh, TV. Paradise Hotel, back way back in two thousand three. After the show. Um, was um, living in Los Angeles, D-list celebrity. Um, and, uh, but I still missed that woman and uh, Carrie. And I, so I called her up and it turned out by then she was going through a divorce. And so I, I hopped a flight, on a flight to New York and we started dating and um, uh, eventually we got married. Me liking to do things big and differently uh, we ended up, we got married at a baseball stadium. We had an idea to create a sponsored wedding uh, promotion um, called Our Field of Dreams. We sold $100,000 in sponsorships to our wedding vendors. So got married in front of 5,000 fans at the end of a, uh, of a baseball game in Coney Island, Brooklyn. It was awesome. Generated so much media. Our wedding vendor said, this was amazing. What are you guys going to do next? Couldn't couldn't get married again, so we started a business instead, and that became my first official business. Um, started a bunch of businesses since then, written a bunch of books, had a bunch of kids. I could go on and on, but I don't know how long this uh, show is, so I'll, I'll, I'll shut up there and just say that um, I'm, 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 I've had a, a, a crazy journey, but I'm, I'm just delighted to 
be in the place that I am now where I can uh, uh, start businesses and write books and, and hopefully help a lot of people. That is awesome. That is awesome, Dave. So, so you're still in Brooklyn? No, I moved out. So I, I um, it was a uh, Brooklyn to Boston to Los Angeles to uh, back to New York, and now I live in Port Washington, just outside the city. Oh, okay. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Bernie Siegel was on here a few weeks ago. He's he was originally from Brooklyn. Uh, you know, ten percent of the world was either born or lived <laughs> in Brooklyn at one point or another, so according to the legend. Yeah. Well, I'm very, very familiar. Well, very comfortable with Brooklyn people uh, come from South Philly. They say it's the, the brother sister of uh, Brooklyn. So it comes with the, the similar accents, they say. <laughs> yes, I, uh, yes, for sure. You could get confused uh, with, uh, with the Brooklynite, with the accent. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Dave. So, yeah, we, I got about, you know, 15, uh, 16 questions here for you. We'll do about two minutes each. I know you're, you're pressed for time today. So, um, Let's talk about your books. Can you tell us about what uh, about your books, what they are, what they're about, um, how many you have, et cetera? Sure. Um, so, so my first book was called Likeable Social Media. We, we started our, 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 I mentioned after the wedding, we started a company and um, and it was a marketing company and social media, this was back, way back 2007, social media became more and more important and we pivoted to focus on a digital uh, word of mouth marketing, social media. And uh, I was fortunate enough, McGraw-Hill came to me and said, hey, we, we're looking for a, like a, um, a, a sort of big intro to social media uh, marketing. And so that, that became my first book ca called Likeable Social Media. And then I realized that the, the, the concepts that I wrote about in Likeable Social Media, uh, things like listening and transparency, vulnerability, authenticity, these weren't just principles of social media, they were actually I, I thought pretty good principles of business. And so I proceeded to, my next couple of books were called Likeable Business and Likeable Leadership. And then I just kind of got broader and broader. So my last book was called The Art of People and um, really focuses on, on, on people skills and how to get more of what you want out of life and out of, and out of business by uh, generating better people skills and, uh, and, and treating people uh, kindly. None of what I write about is rocket science. I, I don't profess to sort of have uh, some secret knowledge inside my head that nobody else has, frankly. Um, and here's the knock on me. A lot of it is common sense. But I guess, um, I guess sometimes it's common sense that maybe people still don't necessarily apply. And so uh, what I like to write about things that uh, will be simple to read and understand. Um, and then once, you know, executed can really make a difference uh, in the world. Um, I have a YA book coming out too. My, my kid said to me, daddy, when are you going to write a book that, uh, that, that we can read? And so I took that as a challenge. And so I wrote a book, uh, my first uh, fiction slash young adult book is coming out in a few months called Normal, about four kids growing up in New York. Uh, and then I'll have another book about delegation. Uh, knowing the publishing world, it probably won't come out until 2020. 22 if I'm lucky, but probably 2023. Uh, but I love I love writing. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm an entrepreneur first. But the truth is that scale, entrepreneur scale and impacting, you know, millions and millions of people is very, very hard with businesses. I mean, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg did it. And Bill Gates did it. And uh, occasionally there are a handful of people that can do it. But most entrepreneurs, even good ones, um, aren't going to be able to reach millions and millions and millions of people, but through books and through writing for ink and through speaking, I can reach far, far more people. So that's kind of why I write and, um, and uh, why I enjoy uh, being able to uh, impact people, not only through my businesses, but through my written words. Well, that's great. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to talk about the, the ink um, role in, in a bit and uh, I have some other questions for you in that regards. But I, I like to, before we go into that area, I like to understand your, about your businesses. So you had a company called Likeable. Is that right? Likeable. Yeah. So Likeable was a social media agency that we just uh -huh. sold a few months ago to a global technology consultant. So it's a kind of cool. Um, so I, I've called myself a serial entrepreneur for years, but I hadn't exited a company. So it's a, it's a little bit of a strange term to call oneself if you're if you haven't actually had a successful exit so with likeables exit i feel a little bit more uh um a little bit more legit 
Oh, that's good. And that that's your baby, though. Like, you had that for a long time, that company, right? Yeah, we started that in 2007, and we wow. just sold it. So it was 14 years uh, in the making. So, yeah, definitely kind of like my fourth child. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've, I, I've, as I've started more businesses, I've become a little bit less, atta- a little bit less attached to them. Kind of like, you know how, like, um, how many, how many people are in, you have any siblings? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, my, my, my poor middle child, it feels like she's always like ignored, right? Like my first kid, we paid attention. We were so concerned. And then by the time I hit my third kid, we just let him run off. So I think as I start more companies, I'm I'm less obsessed over them. I mean, I'm still super passionate about them, of course, but um, you know, Likeable was definitely like a fourth baby. Um, and now I feel like with new businesses, I wouldn't necessarily call them like my fifth and sixth and seventh babies. Yeah, if you had a thousand kids, I mean, how are you gonna remember the thousand the thousandth or the nine hundred and ninety-ninth? I mean, <laughs> the specialness goes out the window. It could be it's like George crazy. Foreman and just name them all George. That's the easy. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah. So, so you're, you're actually pivoting and I'm assuming the sign behind you apprentice is your new fifth child, right? Yeah. Well, we, so we, we have a few companies right now, but the one I'm sort of most focused on and um, is, is called apprentice. Um, I was fortunate enough over the last, over the 14 years of likable and a, another software company that we started called likable local. Um, I would hire all these college students that would work for me while I was, while they were in school part-time and then they would typically come to work for me full-time after they graduated and I was able to mold them and um, train them and and get to know them and they were able to get to know me over the course of that time they worked typically as my EA while they were in school and then they came to work for me full-time and they co-authored books with me and they ran divisions for me and they ran marketing for me and so Rob uh, was a young man that worked for me for a couple years while he was in school and he came to me two and a half years ago and he said, Dave, um, I've learned a lot from you, probably more than I've learned in, in college. And, and I know I've done really good work for you. And I know you've done this before with all these other college students. He said, Dave, I think there's a business model here to match up entrepreneurs like you and college students like me. And I said, yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> and uh, so Rob, at the age of 21, became my business partner on this latest venture called Apprentice. Wow. And the idea is that we match up um, uh, entrepreneurs and, 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 and small business owners with the world's best and brightest college students. Um, and uh, it's, going, it's going great. It's really been an amazing journey. And um, with, with, a print, with a likable... Uh, you know, we sold it for, you know, eight figures. It was a wonderful exit. I feel very, very blessed. Um, but um, now I'm sort of like, now I, now I think I, now I want, now I want to sort of build something even bigger and, and impact more people. And I, I think with Apprentice, we can, we can build something with, you know, really tremendous scale. That is awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, so, all right, let, let's, let's move into the books a little bit more. So you are a New York Times bestselling author uh has that status as a new york times best-selling author brought more opportunities to you and and how oh yeah totally um I, I is didn't, it worth it you know I, i'm sorry is it worth it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean look it, it was a lot of work and it's uh and it's um it's it's it's, it's unpredictable um it's based on a very um uh is algorithm with respect to selling a, a, a not, not just selling how many it's not how many books you sell it's whether you sell them across a wide geographic uh, uh geographically diverse and channel diverse spectrum mm-hmm. um but it's 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 probably for an author or speak it, it doesn't mean as much as an entrepreneur but certainly for an author or speaker i think it's the top brand in the world to be able to put new york times best-selling author um by by your name and um so I would say yes. Um, before the before I hit the New York Times bestseller list, I was doing speaking gigs for free, and and once I hit the New York Times bestselling list, uh, I was bestsellers list. Uh, you know, I was getting 20, 25 grand uh, a, a pop to speak. So to the extent that um, the the sort of credibility and validation and dollars uh, came with it, yeah, I, I do think it was really really valuable. Like maybe even life life changing is. Feels a little bit too big, maybe, but certainly um, very, very valuable. Well, from a financial standpoint, maybe it is life changing, you know, but 20 grand was that for one hour? 
yeah. for a speech? Wow. That's, that's pretty good. Well, well, hold on, hold on. To be fair, I got, I got, I got, I got to be modest here. Knock myself down a little bit. Um, that, that, that there's also, you know, for for twenty twenty five grand, we're talking about international typically. So it's an yeah. hour to speak. But I'm if I'm flying to uh, uh, Hong Kong or yeah. or Singapore. Um, that's by the way, time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so I'm so crazy about my time, and I'm so uh, obsessed with family time that even when I travel, I, I, I'm in and out. So there's a there's a famous song, One Night in Bangkok. Uh, I did one night in Bangkok. I flew 24 hours to Bangkok to speak. Wow. I spoke and then I turned right around and- No and, way, are you serious? Four hours right back <laughs> to New York. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild, wow. but uh, oh well. I've, I've made that trip to Thailand uh, you know, before and geez, I gotta say, it's, that's a dizzying experience. You know, to just go for one day, that really, it's a long, really trip, determined, but, but flying in first, you know, for, they, 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 they paid for first. So, you know, it, was, oh. uh, it, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay. Well, that's awesome. All right, Dave. So the New York times bestselling thing is definitely where, how do you, how do you become a New York times bestseller anyway? Like do you have any tips or strategies? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk, uh, uh, you know, sort of in greater detail. Uh, people can meet with me anytime scheduledave.com. It's a long wait list, but you, anyone can chat with me. But uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's based on um, selling a, a very ge geographically diverse. Uh, uh, so you got to sell in all these states. So you have to make sure your, your audience that your list that you sell to is uh, across a wide variety of, of, of states, as well as uh, diverse channels. So it can't just be Amazon. It has to be Barnes and Noble. It has to be independent bookstores. Um, so the more books that you sell across the more different locations and different channels, uh, the, 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 the more you're going to optimize your chances for hitting the list. You can also do about 50% bulk sales. The rest has to, has to be individual, but you can sell um, to companies, uh, organizations that buy four or 500 books at a time. So that helps of course, sell, sell a lot of books. Um, and then, um, um, you know, looking at the date that you, that you're on sale is, you know, and who you're competing with, that's sort of more typically work that, um, you would do with a, with an agent and a publisher. You can't, I will say, unfortunately, it, it's the easiest time in the world to publish a book, uh, if, if you want to self-publish, but self-published books pretty much won't make the list. So that's one of the sort of downsides to self-publishing. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to ask you. Is this is this formula something you figured out on your own? Because some people have, um, or is this something that the pub, the major publishers already have, and you basically pass the stick to them and hope that they get you there? No, I can't say the major publishers help. I, I I've had a few different publishers, and my last publisher, <laughs> uh, Crown Random House, was actually a wonderful, wonderful publisher to work with. That being said, most publishers really, uh, I think, a lot of authors think. Uh, that if they work with a publisher, they're going to get a lot of help with marketing or distribution or various things. And the reality is that publishers um, expect authors to do quite a bit of the, the heavy lifting these days. So yeah, so and that's my experience has confirmed that too. It, it either comes down to you get yourself a great publicist, which most people think is the same as a publisher, but it's not, or you learn how to be your own just awesome marketer and put it all together yourself. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the biggest advice I can give, whether it's for the New York Times bestseller list or just, just trying to sell a lot of books, is something uh, Seth Godin, uh, who's one of my uh, mentors, people that I look up to a lot, um, taught me really early on, which is like build the platform, build the audience and platform before the book. A lot of authors, they'll write the book and then and they'll, they'll do all this work writing the book and then it'll be an on sale date and, and um, suddenly they're like, okay, so I guess I need to join Twitter or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Instagram, Clubhouse now, or TikTok now. Like, no, you you had to join it a year ago before the book proposal or two years ago or whatever. So yeah, it's really about building the audience. I've, I've been so fortunate slash lucky uh, to build a, a really big audience, especially on LinkedIn. And um, that, that's, that's been a big part of my success uh, too. Yeah, I noticed you're killing it on LinkedIn. Uh, your, your other platforms are good too, but the LinkedIn, you're really, really strong on it. Yeah, and I think some, some. I guess if I can turn that into some quick advice for people that are watching or listening, I mean, some people think they need to be everywhere. And um, while it's helpful to be everywhere, I would say that, you know, sort of knowing your lane and, and finding one platform where, where, where you can really shine 
um, is is probably most valuable. And I, I I guess for me that's that's LinkedIn. That's where I focus the most of my uh, attention and where I have by far the largest audience uh, uh, out there. Thank you. Appreciate it, Dave. All right. So next question. Um, how did it feel to be on a reality TV show? Yeah, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> you know, early on. I, I, sometimes I wonder what would, what it would have been like if I had um, been on done um, done a reality TV like now in the sort of more social media age. Um, but um, it was a really interesting experience, and it was a it was good practice for me to meet new people that I hadn't necessarily been exposed to before. Um, you know, I grew up in New York City, uh, very, very diverse. Um, and I one, one group of people that I hadn't spent a lot of time with was like, um, I don't know, white people for lack of a better way of saying it, like non-diverse people and people that hadn't been exposed. So it was kind of interesting. I, multiple people that I was on the show with um, had never met a Jewish person before. Wow. Wild, right? I mean, sort of, I, I took that for granted, I think, growing up in New York City. Um, and I spent a lot, a lot of time with them, like three months with no phones and no computers and no oh, books. Oh, three no months long? Wow. Three months. And so that's a very, very long time. And um, it's um, what's so strange that people don't really understand when they're not exposed to it, when, they're, when they haven't done it themselves, is that when you don't have any access to the outside world, your world becomes magnified. Everything becomes so much more magnified, which is why people kind of go crazy on all these shows because it's like your whole world, my whole world was these 19 other people for three months. And I had, I had no idea what was going on with my family or the world outside of this house. And that just, that creates a really unnatural, unreal, dare I say, um, atmosphere that is good for television, creates a lot of drama, but it's a very, very hard thing to, to live through. What, what year was that? And was that like similar to Survivor? You were on it was 2003. It was early. It was up against, I think, the first season of Big Brother. Oh, first okay. or second season of Big Brother. It was 2003, early reality show uh, times. Um, uh, Big Brother, Paradise, um, Temptation Island had just uh, launched. Uh, and um, yeah, it was a long time ago now, 18, year, 18 years ago. <laughs> wow. So in, in conclusion, you learned a lot, but it was a, it was a painful process, I guess. It was a painful process. I learned a lot. I, I would, I would never do it again, but if I could <laughs> go back, I would still do it. Right. I would never do it a second time, but I would still, I would still have gone back and, 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 and done it. I, I wouldn't have had as much to drink. Uh, all my <laughs> friends said, all my friends said, Dave, whatever you do, don't get, uh, don't get too, too drunk. And uh, my very first day on the show, I arrived and um, you know, it was all these, sexy good looking people and uh then they just started handing out drinks and uh i had um i had 21 long island iced teas wow my first night on the show so pretty much the opposite of what i should have done and i was uh, not in good shape uh really any uh, the only thing i remember i don't remember anything from that <laughs> night except what was on tv right so um, not, not my, not my proudest moment, but again, you know, you live and learn and, uh, um, it was definitely a unique experience. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of, uh, I, when I was 19, I went on a program called semester at sea and, uh, we get on a boat and basically travel circumnavigate the globe. And there was about seven, six or 700 students and about hundred or 200 crew that were all from the Philippines. And the first night on the boat, my uh, some of my closest friends <laughs> did the same thing, and I'm like, "Oh, this guy's not going to last." <laughs> and you know, they they kind of created their reputation for the next 999 days. It was a hundred day cruise, and it felt like 20 years. But you know, they kind of built their reputation for the rest of the trip. So. Yeah, I had to I had to work my way back um, from uh, there, and uh, I did. I and what was so so cool. I, I actually kind of was the outsider and I kind of eventually won just about everyone over, which was nice and uh, made it to the end and uh, had an unfortunate ending of the show. The, the, uh, there's two couples that won um, and the male, the male that won uh, shared, shared all the money, all the winnings with his female partner, uh, $250,000. So they, they gave, they gave, they gave him two checks. They said, here's a check for 125 grand made out to you. And here's a blank check. 
uh, you can either make it out to you or you can make it out to your partner. Wow. In the second to last uh, scene, he, he says to his uh, female partner, hey, I could have never done this without you. You know, here's a check for 125 grand. And in the final scene, my partner won and they gave her the same thing, two checks. And uh, un unfortunately, she uh, wrote, wrote the check out to herself in the final oh. scene. <laughs> Kind of left me uh, left me in alert, but I was a tragic hero. And you know, 18 years later, it was 125 grand, uh, Anthony, that I would have uh, gotten. And uh, after taxes, I mean, it really is a, essentially inconsequential. But the principle, of course, of losing uh, was uh, was a bit of a it was a bit of a bummer. Yeah, it was a life experience. What's the value of that? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. All right, so let's talk about um, your media. So you, you're a columnist at Inc. Is there any other other place that you write as well. You write for Entrepreneur. I, I thought uh, you wrote for New York Times. Entrepreneur I'm Forbes. I write for uh, Entrepreneur Forbes and I write for LinkedIn. I do I do uh, quite a bit of writing uh, on LinkedIn as well. Uh -huh. I've probably written like 500 or so articles across different, uh, across different platforms. Okay. So writing for these major media outlets, um, would you say that they, they've helped to quantum leap your, uh, your influence level? I think you were hitting at this before. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, people ask around like quality versus quantity. Um, like if I write for Inc., it's it's very high credibility, but it's not a, it's not actually as meaningful as when I write a, an article on LinkedIn for my seven hundred thousand followers. Like that's actually more meaningful. But the credibility that comes with Inc. and Forbes and entrepreneur, admittedly, that is valuable for sure. So I think it's a combination of, 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 of both. Okay. Um, and, you know, you do the clubhouse thing as well. So uh, we're, I, I don't know, were, were you the one that had uh, posted for Natasha Graziano, I think got her a cover, uh, front cover New York Times? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, but I know Natasha and Michael, of course. Okay. I just want to throw out. I was I was curious about that because that was uh, that was definitely a story on Clubhouse. They got married and uh, yeah, they got married on Clubhouse. Clubhouse is a really interesting platform. I um I'm mixed on it. I was very very bullish early on, and I built a business uh, on top of it. I believed that there was massive uh, opportunity. There still might be, um, but um, there's also a lot of it's very. Um, People can be, I, I was unfortunately kind of misled and I had, a, I had, a, I had a, I felt, a, felt betrayed by, by uh, some folks. Um, I'm not going to get into the details, but I think the key lesson for me uh, is that um, while something can be very enchanting, mm -hmm. we, we need to be very cautious about who we go into business with and who we trust that we haven't actually met in real life and known. And um, what's so interesting about Clubhouse and other social audio platforms is, like podcasts actually, mm -hmm. is that the, there's a huge acceleration in uh, trust and intimacy. It speeds up trust and intimacy, but sometimes that can be used for good and sometimes that can go in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And I think folks need to be careful. I, certainly, I know that if I, I'd like to think of myself as a super discerning person. And if I, if I can be, if I can go down the rabbit hole, you know, you know, maybe others can be too. So I, I would just say, uh, word to the wise with Clubhouse and other social audio platforms, be very, very careful, you know, um, uh, about the extent to which trust and intimacy is real versus perceived. No, that, that is definitely great wisdom. And, um, you know, I, I got to say, I, I, being the top host for one of the best clubs on air for entrepreneurs, I've had a lot of crazy experience on both extremes. I've seen a lot of scammers, a lot of scammers there um, that really, they just sit there all day long and they'll build influence and make it look like they're great. But behind those smoke and mirrors um, in the real world, you know, they have nothing to stand on. Um, then on the other extreme, I actually personally witnessed um, opportunities that came to me like the 13 steps to riches the book series i'm in right now where the ceo uh, don green wrote the forward for and um sharon lecter and all these amazing celebrities are in there. there's 13 books about uh napoleon hill's think and grow rich book um i would never that would never have one out 
clubhouse. Some of the people I met, like Ivan Meisner was on the other day, um, would never have met them. He came in my room one night. Um, I can quote countless examples like that. Um, so that's the great side. And then what you said it definitely is absolutely true. And I actually experienced that more in the beginning, um, reverse kind of what you did, because I, you know, I don't know. It's just I was walking in people's rooms and finding out they were scams. So mm -hmm. I learned, I learned the, the, <laughs> in the beginning, um, I'm, it's easier for me to kind of screen them out now. But for the beginner, yeah, that's, a, that's definitely, you know, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but that's definitely um, something they should look out for. You're right about that. Yeah, I, 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 and, and to an extent with all social platforms, right? It's like yeah. um, the, 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 the good thing about social media is it gives us um, unprecedented access uh, to people. Uh, you can private message, you know, any, almost any celebrity in the world on Instagram, they may or may not reply, but you can, you can have that conversation, you know, 20 years ago that that wasn't happening. Right. That just, right. that just couldn't have happened. Um, but on the other hand, uh, with access can come, uh, can come this, uh, sort of, um, you know, bad, bad actors and, uh, and, and, and folks that, you know, can, can create an image that maybe isn't so real. It's like that. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Sure. Okay, so you, you are certainly in the realm of being considered a, a marketing guru. So why is marketing crucial for all businesses? Well, thank you for the title. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not calling myself that, but I appreciate. Hey, your you got a, you got an eight-figure exit. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, my my um my uh, you know I think um. Marketing and sales are, are, are very, very important and, uh, and product as well, uh, depending on what, you know, obviously what your business is, but um, you could have the best products in the world, but if people don't know about it, then it's not, doesn't really mean much, right? If the tree falls in the forest. So, um, so, so yeah, so I think it's really, really important to uh, build a, a brand and connect with an audience and, and, uh, and find folks and um, bring them in and then, and then sale again, depending on the type of products, marketing and both marketing and sales, are, are, are very, very important. And, uh, um, and I think, again, accessible, more accessible than, than, than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, storytelling has always been the best way to do marketing, but in order to tell stories uh, 20, 30 years ago, you'd have to uh, buy a billboard or buy a TV spot or buy a radio spot or, um, you know, buy a trade show, buy a conference booth, a booth at a trade show. And now with the social and dig or digital, you can, uh, there's like infinite ways to get to reach your audience. And that's, that's to me really exciting. It gives everyone a, a, a relatively level playing field. Um, of course, the big businesses still have far, far bigger resources, but you know, anyone, anyone, any business of any size can, uh, can, can create a, a TikTok video that goes viral and uh, generates uh, a real business. So to me, that's a, a really, really cool thing about marketing. How, how did you learn to all this stuff about marketing and become to your level? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I just learned by experience. I, I, I never took a single uh, marketing class, a single communications class, a single wow. business class in school. I studied, really? studied education. I studied elementary education to be a teacher and psychology. Now, I will say my psychology degree probably taught me a thing or two about human behavior and, 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 and human responses and whatnot. But I think really I learned by doing, by, 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 uh, by taking lots and lots of chances, making lots and lots of mistakes, making a fool of myself. I mean, I mean, I, I was uh, uh, courageous as the cruncher munch guy to make a fool of myself and, and be laughed at by thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there was thousands of people that also, you know, pay, gave me money. And, and <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, with marketing, we don't need 100% of the world to uh, buy our product or pay attention to us. Uh, we need um, a, a, a big enough percentage of our target market to pay attention to us and buy our product. And so uh, to me, um, I just love testing stuff and learn and practicing and learning. And um, again, I still don't know that how much I know versus, you know, experts that have studied it, but I've, I've, um, I've failed enough times um, and, and had a few successes along the way to be able to have a little bit more confidence around what's kind of what works and what doesn't. Uh, that's brilliant brilliant and that's it's very important you have to have to learn sometimes you know uh, the, the the logic behind 
um, education is to teach you so you don't have to waste money on your own. But sometimes if you're entering, especially a new new realm, you're paving a new path, you're going to be the one that, that, that digs up that, that spends that money to get that learning curve. Uh, unfortunately, right? Especially if you're new to, to a specific product or service, creating something new. Yeah. Yeah. But again, in, in today's world, it's not as, not nearly as costly to test stuff. So that's the, that's the good news. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Dave. All right. Uh, one last question before we start going into the uh, business questions. How has the great pandemic depression made you stronger? Well, you know, I've built a couple of remote sort of focused businesses. So um, I, that's been um, uh, um, great. Um, uh, it's very sadly, I've lost five people. Uh, my mom, my dad, my grandma, um, uh, and, um, uh, and maybe it's only four. <laughs> I've lost four people. My mom, my dad, my grandma, and my uncle. And um um, that's been very hard, of course, but to, in terms of making me stronger, I, I've, um, to, to help me, uh, solidify some relationships with family members. And I started a business of being a, a serial entrepreneur uh, called remembering.live, a virtual memorial services business that, uh, helps uh, we've, we've been able to help over 10,000 people and over 500 gr uh, gr grieving families. Uh, so that's, um, so yeah, it's been, um, it's been, it's been good. And I've said, and, and, and it's certainly made me a stronger dad because I, you know, no more commuting. Hmm. So it's it allowed me to spend more time with my kids, which is probably more important than any of the business stuff. Absolutely. Dave. And by the way, sorry for your losses. I, I, uh, my heart goes out to you. Thank it's you. been, it's been a rough, uh, rough journey. I, I've also, I've lost a lot of, uh, a lot of people too. Just, just crazy times. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sorry as well. Yeah, totally crazy times. Really un unprecedented, really, in our lifetime. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. All right. Um, can one book change the world, Dave? Oh, totally. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I've been very blessed. I mean, I, I um, get to be having written four books now, and, um, you know, some of them have sold better than others, but um, I get, I get, a ma I get, I, I, um, I had an email today from somebody that said, um, I changed his life. And I mean, well, I mean, what a, what a, what a, what an amazing gift to me to get feedback like that. And uh, whether true or not, it's a really a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, books can change the world. Give and take uh, is one of my favorite. I don't, I don't, you didn't ask me this yet, but if you were going to ask me for a favorite book, give and take by Adam Grant uh, to change my life and uh, helped me to help solidify, you know, how important it is for me to uh, give. Uh, give without ex expectation of anything in return. So yeah, books can definitely change the world. Now, now the, the, just follow up with that question. So that guy that or that person that you sent you that email said that you changed his life. Now imagine if that guy turns out to be the next president or next leader of this world and you had that effect on him. And that's no, that's I know it's, it's very, it's very <laughs> humbling and just a rich, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing gift, uh, uh, to be able to, um, impact people that way. And, um, yeah, and I get, I get, I get, a, I get, a, yeah, I'm going to sound like a jerk to say I get a lot of emails like that, but I've got, I, you know, I, that, that's, it, it, I consistently hear. Uh, feedback, which is n nice. Now, I I'm just glad that all the people that hate the books don't uh, write to me. So that 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 that's uh, fortunate for me. But uh, yeah, I, I I think authors, entrepreneurs, and I, I mentioned this earlier, entrepreneurs and authors can both really change the world with their ideas. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's huge. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. All right, so we're gonna pivot now to networking. What role has networking played in your life? Oh, it's everything. Um, I, I, the only thing networking is a bit of a, um, is, like sales networking is a bit of a, um, dirt, it, it's considered a dirty word by some and, 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 and it's a, it gets a bad rap. People think networking means, I think they, some people still think networking means like showing up, uh, at a, at some like a function and like giving out a business card everywhere. Yeah. Right? Um, to me, networking is simply um, finding people and helping them. <laughs> like that's like super simple and by doing that i've been able to build up um i mean uh really just an unbelievably a uh, large and powerful uh, network of people um 
that uh, have helped me and have helped others. So yeah, network networking is to me, it's, um, if I had to, you know, two skills, if you will, or skill sets that have been the most influential in my life, I would say listening, which is arguably a subset of networking and networking, right? It's just, 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 you never know how somebody will impact your life until you have a conversation. I, I talk to everyone on planes, on trains. Uh, uh, I, I, I met, I'll tell you somebody that changed my life, you know, networking. Uh, I was, um, I was a uh, pr pretty early entrepreneur, a um, few years in, um, and uh, I was uh, thinking about running for office um, in New York. Uh, I had this, you know, sort of desire to serve and 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 maybe get into politics at some point. So um, I'm, I'm I'm building the business. I'm building my family, and I'm thinking about running for office all at the same time. And I'm. I hop on a plane from New York to Boston. And as the plane's taking off, I look to my right, the guy next to me is uh, reading this, um, what looks like a speech, a big, big print. And I see my dear friend, uh, uh, the late uh, uh, Kennedy. And then I see when I authored the GI Bill. And so I realized it was a congressperson. And so I just, but I didn't know who it was. But so, but again, to network, I, I, uh, I basically said, excuse me, it's such an honor to meet you. I'm, I'm Dave Kirpin. And um, he, of course, um, returned as, as, as anyone would do, uh, put his hand back out and, 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 and introduced himself. And it was Frank Lautenberg. Um, Frank was the, uh, was a senator from New Jersey for 25 years. Um, and uh, he was actually 80, he was 84 when I met him. Prior to his career in government, which by the way, he was an incredibly influential Senator. He wrote the no smoking on airlines bill. He wrote the GI bill. He wrote, um, he, he, he passed the, the law, the law of the drinking age uh, of 21 in the United States. Some people hate that, but that's, but uh, you know, parents probably like it more. So, um, <laughs> but before, but he, but listen to this. Before Frank's career in government, he found that he was an entrepreneur and he started a little business called ADP, a payroll company that he took public uh, and now has forty thousand employees. So, wow. um, an unbelievable career. And um, you know, he's talked to me the whole time. Uh, Forty-five minutes later, uh, the plane is touching down, and he says to me, uh, "Dave, I, I want to show you a picture of my greatest legacy." And I'm like. What's he going to show? A picture of him with one of the presidents, a, a bill that he signed into law, maybe a picture when he took the uh, company public, uh, the stock exchange. Um, he says, this is a picture of my uh, four kids and my seven grandkids. He said, this is my biggest legacy. He said, you know, none of my work in government or business will be on my tombstone, but all of their names will be. Mm. So profound and That's so powerful. meaningful to me. Um, and we stayed in touch. So he talked about networking, right? We stayed in touch. I uh, helped actually helped his team out a little bit with social media. And um, he was a terrific mentor to me for a few years. He passed away. Uh, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to attend his funeral. And it was like a who's who of, uh, of, 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 of leaders. Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden both spoke. But more importantly, Anthony, um, uh, his four children and seven grandchildren all spoke and they all uh, demonstrated that uh, he was truly a, a father first and a grandfather first. And th that really helped me to uh, solidify, you know, my own priorities and um, ended up, this was, I had two kids at the time. We ended up having our third, a third child uh, after a Frank and uh, we named him uh, Seth Franklin uh, after, uh, after Frank Lautenberg. Wow. Anyway, I digress quite a bit. So sorry for the long digression, but no, that's an interesting kind of networking and the belief that you never know, um, you never know how somebody will impact your life. So it's basically always worth starting up a conversation in a plane or a train or anywhere that you are. That was a great story. I really like that, Dave. That's really cool. And it went full circle. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So um, is mentoring important? And, and who were some of your mentors? I think you already touched on this. Maybe you could summarize yeah. in 30 seconds or so. Mentorship is, 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 is one of my personal core values. One of the core values that Apprentice now that we're focused on. I believe that anyone can be 
uh, both a student and a teacher. So we all have something to teach, but we all have something to learn. So my apprentice is 21 years old. Uh, uh, my apprentice, Francesca, she's teaching me about TikTok, for instance. I don't understand TikTok. She's teaching me. It's great. Um, I've been so fortunate to have some great mentors. I mentioned Frank, Jim McCann, the founder and chairman of 100flowers.com. Incredible uh, mentor for me. Um, uh, Sally Krawcheck, uh, uh, Randy Zuckerberg. Um, I've, I've, I've had so many amazing, Jeff Hazlett. Um, so many amazing uh, people that have, uh, Vern Harnish, uh, founder of Entrepreneurs Organization, um, just some really, really great mentors. And, 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 I, and I am so dedicated. I, I mentor people every single Thursday afternoon, scheduledave.com, free mentorship. And I, I mentor quite a few uh, other uh, entrepreneurs. So it's something I really enjoy and gives me quite a bit of uh, satisfaction. Thank you, Dave. By the way, The Apprentice, is that any affiliation with the show, The Apprentice? This is its own. No, no, no affiliation. I, I don't know that it's the most convenient thing, but eventually uh, we'll, be a, we'll be a bigger brand than that, than that one. <laughs> Watch them under the rug. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dave. Um, all right. So from a finance perspective, what are, what are your fi favorite financial books? Oh, good question. Um, probably... Uh, Probably think and grow rich, um, uh, rich dad poor dad. Um, oh, uh, David Bach is a friend of mine. Aut automatic millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say those are all those are all good ones. Oh, that's great. Uh, and I, I I forgot to invite you. I got to send uh, send you some copies. Uh, maybe we could talk about, uh, offline. You know, I uh, would love to give you some free copies. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dave. They're great picks. All right. Um, do we need money to survive? Yes. But not a lot. But not a lot. There's, a, there's incredible data that shows that uh, there's very, very little correlation with uh, happy money and happiness after $75,000 a year. So, you know, you need $75,000 a year in the United States of America, at least. And depending on where you're watching or listening, you may need less probably won't need more but maybe need a little bit more in some places but beyond that um there's not there's very very little correlation uh, between uh between uh, uh, uh money and happiness and and money of course does not buy happiness that is for sure i know so many miserable rich people <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is very very true very true all right thank you dave uh next question following in line with that is finance necessary for everyone uh, learning finance, the science learning, the subject. Yeah, 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 uh, totally. Learning finance is super important. And it's a, uh, it's a skill that, you know, there's a bunch of skills. I, I actually was a teacher for a couple of years um, in between Paradise Hotel and, and, and our wedding and, and, and going into entrepreneurship. And um, our school system has so many challenges. And one is that financial literacy is not taught, um, nor is character education or emotional education, which is also really, really important. Um, but financial literacy is what you asked me about. So yeah, I mean, people, um, kids don't don't learn this in school, and they absolutely should uh, be taught uh, how to balance a checkbook, how to uh, understand investing and saving, and uh, um, it's a compounded interest. I mean, it, it is a darn shame that uh, most kids and maybe even most adults don't understand some of the basics of uh, financial literacy. Thank you, Dave. All right. And how important is having a purpose in business? And what is your purpose? It's really, really important. I'm a huge fan of purpose and core values uh, for all of my businesses. Um, they, the, my purpose is going to be different depending on each business. But um, our purpose at Apprentice, uh, for example, um, is to uh, connect the world's hungry students with the world's open leaders. So anyone that's open to learning as, and, and teaching as a leader and anyone that is hungry as a student, we, our purpose is to connect those, those two groups of people. Um, if I had a broader purpose, um, well, the purpose of Likeable was to create a more likable world, help organizations be more likable in their, in their business and, and uh, marketing practices. Um, if I had a purpose in, in life, it's to leave the world a better place, you know, than I than I uh, than I found it in in as many ways as possible. Well, that's and it's really good you 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 ended it there, um, Dave, because 
that's the thing about like having a business as you talked about and at some point you might have to leave that business be an exit and go on to something else if your purpose is for that business at that moment um fine but at some point you have to be able to uh, any entrepreneur you have to understand that if they sell that business or retire from that business what are you going to do after that so yeah. having that other piece added to that your, your last answer um really helped to focus to you the individual the purpose for you not separate from likable the business you had a purpose for that but what the purpose for you is and you separated that out and that's that uh that definitely um i think helps out a lot for your future businesses right yeah and i, I see i see i see a lot of um entrepreneurs struggling with their identity being too closely tied up with their business and right. uh, um and 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 look, uh, the, when I sold Likeable, it was not not the easiest thing because uh, I did, you know, I wrote books with Likeable in it, and it was a big part of my brand, but um, it did not define me. And uh, so I do think that's 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 important. Thank you, Dave. What, so what, how I didn't ask you this, but what um, what do you do now? Like you have books, like you said, they're Likeable. Your club on Clubhouse called Likeable. I mean, you're completely separated from that now. Where do you go from here in terms of those things? We had a complicated uh, uh, um, <laughs> uh, brand licensing agreement as part of the uh, the deal terms, yes. Uh, uh, okay. yeah. But I will, I will not be starting any more likable brands. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dave. I didn't even know how to ask that question. I was just curious. All right, no, thank problem. You. no problem. <laughs> um, all right. Last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Second, two more questions. What would you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so? Why? You're, you're a rather young guy and you got a lot of, a lot of great things ahead. What, what do you want to do? Let's say just next 10 years. Yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll certainly start and grow more businesses. I'd love for, to get apprenticed to uh, not nine figures, uh, which is uh, uh, bold and ambitious, but we'd love to do that. And, but I'd love to invest in a lot more. Um, we, we started a venture fund called Curb and Ventures to invest in uh, specifically women-owned businesses and people of color, um, essentially underrepresented uh, founders. Uh, uh, I, I happen to be a white guy. You happen to be a white guy, but... Uh, like a ridiculously high percentage of all investment dollars goes to white guys. And I'm trying to help ch change that score. And, um, and uh, I do, um, I, I want to keep investing in great entrepreneurs and helping them build businesses. Thank you, Dave. What would you like to be your legacy to this world? Um, well, for certainly my family, and uh, certainly my, um, my ability to impact uh, lives, you know, at scale, if I can help inspire people, help, um, help create and support uh, entrepreneurs um, and uh, those maybe that don't uh, have, have as much of a voice as others, uh, I think that would be a, a great thing. Thank you, Dave. That was awesome. All right, Dave. So. Uh, we're going to conclude now. I want to first thank you for, for uh, coming on here today and um, spend the time to, to answer these questions and getting to know you a lot better. Um, before, before we close out, though, I'd like to just turn the floor over to you and, uh, you know, anything you want to say, you want to, you know, promote your products, services, websites. Um, the floor is yours, Dave. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm easy to find online. I'm not going to promote anything, but um, you know, apprentice is easy to find online and I'm easy to find online. And if anyone wants to want some help, uh, feeling stuck, they want to jump into my free uh, office hours. Um, it's scheduledave.com. There's a long wait list. Sorry about that, but, uh, Hey, you know, you get free access and I appreciate uh, you. Uh, thank, thanks so much for uh, making some time for me. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to close out and Dave, um, if you can just hang around for a moment after I close out the show, I just want to walk you out and say thank you and stuff all right so so thank you folks you've been watching the dr finance live podcast dr anthony created the fourth year also known as dr finance we have dave kirpin on today so definitely check out dave uh on his social media sites he's he's pretty much everywhere right dave facebook twitter all that stuff linkedin pretty much everywhere i finally got onto tiktok thanks to my apprentice <laughs> okay that's great all right and then you can check out more information about myself, drfinance.info. I'll be posting this 
pretty much everywhere, folks, every blog, uh, I'm sorry, every podcast directory out there, YouTube, um, and on my website, Dr. Finance Live, I'm sorry, drfinance.info slash podcast. And then, of course, my books this way, The Necessity of Finance. I wrote that about 10 years ago for my students. It's about how important finance is, okay? And then the most important lessons in economics and finance. I would read that, those first and second in that order until you get to this book, because it definitely uh, prefaces for this. The Survival of the Richest, a book about this thick. A lot of different arguments in there. So um, read those. And then, uh, of course, I'm writing the 13 Steps to Riches book. It's a uh, compilation that basically um, an interpretation of Napoleon Hill's 13. Uh, his book was called Think and Grow Rich. There were 13 steps to riches in there. And that's what it's honoring. So thank you, folks. Like and subscribe and follow. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks again for joining us. Bye bye now.